It was March 19th of 2003. I was living in Fairhope, Alabama, and it was about time for the evening news to come on, so I went into my den and I turned on Channel 15 out of Mobile, uh, NBC, and the announcer said, we open tonight's news with a breaking story out of Birmingham, Alabama. Massive accounting fraud uncovered at HealthSouth. It's estimated that there's almost $3 billion worth of bogus numbers on their books. At that moment, I knew probably in the not too distant future, I would be in prison. How did it all begin? I first met Richard Scrucci in the summer of 1980. I was living in Houston, Texas, and I'd recently passed the CPA exam. I actually majored in economics while I was in college, but after being out of school for more than 10 years, I'd taken enough accounting that I could sit for the exam, and I passed it. And it was at a point where I wanted to go to work for a large company. I'd always worked for very small companies, never worked with or for another CPA. I answered an ad in the Houston Chronicle for a controller position at LifeMark Corporation. LifeMark was a New York Stock Exchange for-profit hospital company. The interview was with Richard Scrushy, and I knew that I'd met somebody very different. <clears throat> All during the job interview, my head was just spinning up. I was mesmerized by the guy. And by the end of the interview, I was totally convinced that that was the best job I could have in Houston, Texas. But as I was driving home, I kept thinking about the guy, and by the time I got home, I told my wife, and what I told her that day has since been quoted in the New York Times, in the Wall Street Journal, other places. I told my wife that I thought I'd met the most brilliant businessman I would ever meet, or maybe the biggest con artist I would ever meet. Richard offered me the job, I reported to work, and I'd been at my desk for about five minutes. I just walked in the front door. And Richard came into my office and he said, Aaron, I'm presenting a contract to my boss. It's a contract I think we should sign. I'd like for you to sit in on my presentation. I said, sure, Richard. We went into his boss's office. He introduced me and he said, Aaron and I worked on this contract for hours last night. I hadn't worked on anything. I just walked in the front door. Today, after everything that's happened, I truly believe that he told that lie to size me up. He thinks four and five steps ahead of most people, and he wanted to see how I would behave being included in a lie. I didn't take him to task over it. I'm not a particularly assertive kind of person. I just thought he was trying to make me look good the first day on the job. I worked for Richard for almost four years at LifeMart, and I learned a lot from him. First thing you learn is that he has a big ego. In fact, I don't think I'll ever have met or will ever meet a man with a bigger ego than Richard Scrushy. But I did learn from him. He was a good businessman. He taught me a lot of stuff. First time I'd worked for a very large, this was a New York Stock Exchange company, and I learned a lot from him. But after being there for almost four years, I came in one morning and I picked up a Wall Street Journal, and the headline was, AMI and Life Mark to Merge. AMI was a much larger hospital company out of California. And the article in the Wall Street Journal said they'd be closing the offices in Houston, Texas. And I thought, you know, man, I may be without a job. But what happens when large companies like this merge, and these were two New York Stock Exchange companies, venture capitalists come around to see if someone has an idea for a startup company. Citicorp Venture Capital contacted <clears throat> Bill Mackey, the chairman of the board, and asked if there was such a person. And Mr. Mackey said, Richard Scrushy is your man. He's absolutely brilliant. We made him a full vice president when he was only 26 years old. And he's been talking to us about doing things outside of the hospital. Believe it or not, the cost of health care was front page news even in the early 1980s. And people were coming up with ways to lower health care costs. Richard's concept was get people out of the hospital as fast as you can. One of the most expensive places in the world to spend a night is in an acute care hospital. For example, if you were in an automobile accident and after your acute care stay you needed physical therapy, 
Back then, your physician might keep you in the hospital and you would receive your therapy as an inpatient in the hospital. Virtue said, no, no, send them home. Let them receive their therapy as an outpatient in a much lower cost setting. He convinced Citicorp to put a million dollars into a startup company to open a chain of outpatient rehab centers. Now Richard needed a management team, he needed a CFO, and he wanted me to be that person. And I was kind of ready to get away from Richard. I learned that he told lots of white lies and uh, his ego was oppressive. But he's a good salesman. He said, Aaron, put in $5,000. You'll get 100,000 shares in the company. That's a nickel a share. <clears throat> and he said, you got to realize Citicorp is paying a dollar a share for their million shares. So your $5,000 is already worth 100000 based on what they're paying. I knew Richard could build a big company. I didn't have a lot of doubt about that. And I liked the concept. I thought a company that lowered health care costs made sense. So I made the decision to go with Richard in his new company. Now, Richard was from Alabama. So we moved to Birmingham, Alabama. We opened our first outpatient center. And we tried to make it look like a fitness center or a spa. <coughs> we did not want the patients to feel like they were going back into a building full of sick people. We charged less than the acute care hospitals did, and it worked. Our first center made more money than we thought it would. It broke even sooner than we thought it would. And I knew early on that I was probably on the ground floor of something pretty exciting. During the first year we were in business, we maybe only had... 10 or 15 people in our corporate office, and I'm very much a morning person, but I came in one morning, and Richard had gotten there before me, and he had drawn this stick figure image of people pulling a wagon. And when we all got there, he gave us a, like a motivational speech. He said, the two guys out front with the handle are doing a pretty good job. He said, but some of you are riding in the wagon. This guy's pulling the wagon backwards. This guy's just not doing much of anything. And... It became a company motto, pull the wagon, work as a team. And he left that flip chart drawing up in the lobby of our corporate office. And as the years went by, he had that exact drawing framed and it hung in the lobby of every Health South facility next to a large picture of himself. <laughs> At the end of the year, if you're an outstanding employee, you've maybe got 100 shares of stock and you got a little red wagon. It was called the pulling the wagon aboard. In 09, I wrote a book about Health South, and I was trying to come up with a title. My wife actually gave me the title. She said, just call it Health South, The Wagon to Disaster. So uh, as we started opening these outpatient centers, we noticed that there was a need for rehabilitation hospitals, specialty hospitals that did intensive rehab. Pretty soon, we noticed that outpatient surgery was a big business and we got into the outpatient surgery business. So as we grew Health South into a big company, we had three main businesses, <clears throat> outpatient rehabilitation, rehab hospitals, and outpatient surgery. Within two years, we were talking to investment bankers about going public. And I think the most important meeting in the history of the company took place with some investment bankers way back then. A couple of guys from a firm called Drexel Burnham flew to Birmingham to talk to Richard and I about going public. And at the end of the day, the, the banker said, look, you have a good-looking company, your business plan is sound, I like your management team. He said, but you're, you're still losing money. You're a startup company. He said, we can't take you public until we know you can make a bottom-line profit. He said, as soon as you do, though, we, we'd love to take you public. Excuse me a second. He said, you tell me your centers lose a little money when you first open them for a few months, but he said, you're opening a lot of centers. He said, how are you accounting for that? And I said, well, we're being conservative and we're expensing our startup costs. And he said, no, no, no capitalize those costs, put them on the balance sheet, and write them off over several years. He said, if you do, I think you're going to show a profit much sooner, and we'll take you public. 
Richard went bananas. Aaron, Aaron, why are you letting the accounting tell Wag the dog? I'm out here killing myself trying to get this company public, and your silly accounting is hurting the company. I'm embarrassed that this man had to fly down here from New York City and explain something so simple to you. Let me tell you what your job is as a CFO. It's to make the bottom line look good all the time, and don't you ever forget that. That was the way Richard was. He didn't mind beating you up in front of other people. I ran the concept by our auditors after I redid the numbers and everything, and they said it was okay. But they warned me that it could be abused and not to abuse it. And, of course, we abused the hell out of it. So starting day one, HealthSouth was probably putting things on its balance sheet that should have stayed on the P&L. But within about six months, we were showing a profit, and we registered to go public. Now, the way the process works is you register with the SEC, you file up what they call an S-1 document, and while the SEC is approving your deal, you go on a road show. You go to New York, Boston, Chicago, San Francisco, L.A., all of the financial centers, and sent primarily to institutional investors. Your final road show is always in New York City. That's the big one. That's the day before you price your stock and you begin trading and uh, Putnam, Fidelity, all the big mutual funds are there. Richard made the presentation, and when he finished, he got a standing ovation. And it seemed to go on forever. And the investor sitting next to me was shaking his head, and he finally said, he said, I've never seen anything like this. He said, normally investors do not applaud on road shows. <clears throat> and he says, all my years on Wall Street, I've never seen anybody get a standing ovation. He said, the truth of the matter is, you guys should not be going public. Your company is just barely two years old. Your audited top line is only $5 million. You and Richard have no track record that you can run a public company. He said, but you're going to get the deal done because Richard Scrushy is the best salesman I've ever heard on a roadshow. We did get the deal done. We had to actually lower our price on the offering, which is a a big sign of weakness. We, we were hoping to go out between 8 and $10 a share, but we, we went public at six fifty. But within less than a year, we were well over $20 a share. You can do the arithmetic. I'm now a millionaire. I had my 100,000 shares. I'd also gotten 50 more in 50,000 in options at $1 a share. <coughs> and I've got a net worth uh, liquid stock well over a million dollars, several million. It changed me a little bit. As soon as I could, I sold a little bit of stock and I went out and paid cash for a Mercedes. I never owned a Mercedes before. That was a lot of fun. As the years went by and the stock did very well, I built about an 8,000 square foot home in Birmingham. I bought a condo in the French Quarter in New Orleans. I had three beach houses on St. George Island in Florida. Every year I bought a new Porsche, BMW, Lexus, whatever kind of car I wanted. And I noticed as I flew to New York City that all the investment bankers wore these beautiful Hermes silk ties. And I bought $30,000 worth of them. They're really good looking ties. Now, the newfound wealth really changed Richard Scrushy. It was like this huge ego was now on steroids. What is that doing in my slideshow? Have y'all seen this guy's billboards? They're everywhere. He's hacked into my PowerPoint. Golly. I have to get that out of there. It was like his huge ego was now on steroids. He had always wanted to be a rock and roll star. So he formed a band called Proxy, and he began playing rock music at company events and at nightclubs and at music festivals. And He wasn't that good of a singer in a Band didn't take off like he thought it should. <coughs> so he went to Nashville. He bought himself a black cowboy hat. He hired people from Sawyer Brown and the Oak Ridge Boys to back him. He produced an album, and he wrote a song called Honk If You Love to Honky Tonk. He sent out memos nationwide to all of our employees, telling them to call their radio station and have them play Honk If You Love to Honky Tonk. But he also started always carrying a gun in his briefcase. 
and as the years went by, he hired bodyguards that followed him everywhere he went. But in spite of these things, he was a darling of Wall Street. Six other companies went public doing essentially the same thing we did. Richard Scrooge was given credit for not taking one company public, but creating an entire new niche <coughs> for healthcare investors to invest in. People wanted Richard Scrooge on their board of directors. He eventually was appointed to the board of trustees of the University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa. Interesting thing is, he never graduated from high school. Now that there are six companies doing what we were doing, we started buying those companies up. We'd trade our stock for their stock. Our stock always had a higher P.E. ratio, and uh, investment bankers are very good at putting deals together like that. So in the early 90s, we started acquiring companies along the order of half a billion, billion dollar transactions. Now here's the timeline. We started the company in 84, went public in 86. By 1995, we were the largest company in the state of Alabama. We were operating in all 50 states. We had almost 50,000 employees. We owned more outpatient centers, more rehab hospitals, <coughs> and more surgery centers than any other company in the United States. And we were 350th on the Fortune 500 list. I was a rock star in Birmingham. I could go into any restaurant or nightclub and people would recognize me. They'd want to come up and buy me a drink. I always thought it kind of odd that people want to buy you stuff when you're rich, but it was quite the deal. The company started taking on some of Richard's big personality. We started buying jet airplanes. By 1995, we owned 12 jets, two Gulf Streams, which are $40 million airplanes. A typical day for Richard and I would be to go to our hangar, get on our Gulf Stream, We'd fly up to Teterboro Airport in New Jersey. On the way up, somebody would prepare us breakfast. We'd land at Teterboro. There'd be a helicopter waiting for us. It flies into Manhattan. There'd be a limo waiting for us. We'd go meet with investors at the Plaza Hotel or Trump Tower or someplace like that. And it was quite the deal. That night, we flew home. We didn't have to stop in Atlanta. <laughs> you live in the South, you understand that. So it was quite the deal. It really was just amazing. And you'd probably say, well, wow, what could go wrong? One word, really, and the word is greed. We were very greedy. It was fun being rich, buying these ties and flying in our private airplanes and buying cars and condos and whatever. For Richard, it was really a big deal. In 1995, he told the Birmingham newspaper, I want to be a billionaire. I hope to be the richest man in the state of Alabama. And I estimated in 1995 that he was worth $600 million. In 1997, he was the highest paid executive in the United States. He took home $110 million in that one year. LeBron James doesn't make that kind of money. <coughs> now here's what he would do. He would meet with the stock analysts every year and ask them, what do we need to earn next year for you to keep a strong buy on our stock? He totally controlled his board of directors. He gave himself millions of options every year, and he understood if he could keep the stock price going up, he could become a billionaire. So he would ask them, what do we need to earn? And they would tell him, and he would always say, we can do that, not a problem didn't matter what our projections really showed. He just simply promised Wall Street whatever it took to keep the stock price going up. It really wasn't a problem the first two, three, four years. HealthSouth was a very good company. We were making lots of money. Our basic business strategy was to align ourselves with the best orthopedic surgeons in the United States because they ordered the rehab. <coughs> In Birmingham, Dr. Jim Andrews, which I think all of you are familiar, familiar with, practiced at our hospital. He's the renowned orthopedic surgeon in the United States. He did Bo Jackson's hip, Troy Aikman's shoulder. He told the New Orleans Saints Drew Brees could still throw the football. Uh, he's a team physician for the Washington Redskins. And a few years ago when their star quarterback, R2-D2, or whatever his name is, got hurt, 
Dr. Andrews was on the field to take care of. So it was really, uh, like I say, quite, quite the deal. As the years went by, though, it became more and more difficult to deliver the numbers that Richard was telling Wall Street. So I started doing what I call aggressive accounting. As you probably know, in accounting, <coughs> there's a lot of estimating. There's a lot of things that are gray, and you can use your judgment sometime to help the bottom line. Uh, I started lowering our bad debt expense, doing some things that I shouldn't have done. Not fraudulent because we disclosed what we were doing to our auditors, <coughs> to the SEC. Was it good accounting, though? No. You don't run your numbers and say, huh, these numbers stink. Let's just change the way we do our accounting. That's not good accounting. But that's what we did. Over time, Wall Street started noticing that our cash flow didn't seem to match our earnings, and the stock began to trade down. In the second quarter of 1996, we had missed the numbers pretty badly. We're still making money, but not making the numbers that <coughs> Richard promised. Bill Owens, my chief accountant, and I, Bill had worked for our auditors, decided we had to, we couldn't play with the numbers anymore. It was becoming transparent that we were doing some bad accounting. <clears throat> so we prepared ourselves to go into Richard's office and tell him that we had to report numbers below street expectations. And I knew it was going to be about as much fun as telling him that he couldn't sing. <laughs> but we went into his office and we laid it out. His face turned red started trembling. Get out of my office! Have you guys lost your minds? We are not going to report bad numbers. If we do, the stock's going to crash. We're going to be sued. Your stock options will be worthless. You won't be the rock stars in Birmingham anymore. <clears throat> he said, here's the problem. You've gotten lazy. You guys are smart. You know how to fix these numbers. Get back in your office and do it. I thought he was going to get on his knees and beg us, and he kept telling us that he could not report bad numbers. Finally, Bill Owens, who had worked for our auditor, said, look, <coughs> we have 1,500 general ledgers. He said, I can make entries small enough and spread them through those 1,500 ledgers, and I, the auditors won't look at it because I'll keep it below their thresholds, and we'll, I'll get the numbers where they need to be. He said, now, Aaron, Richard, I will be crediting revenue we did not generate, and I will be debiting assets we do not have. Richard thought about it for a moment, and he said, guys, this is our best option. We'll only do it this one time. <coughs> Employees won't lose a job. Stockholders won't get hurt. And you guys know everybody does this kind of thing. At that point, I should have had the courage to stand up to Richard and say no. But I stand before you today telling you I was a coward. I was intimidated by Richard. <coughs> I knew he had a gun in his briefcase. And I did, did not want to be the one to cause his net worth to go down by several hundred million dollars. So that night, I let Bill Owens cook the books. The next day when I went into work, I felt like I had blood on my hands. I felt like people were staring at me. <coughs> Apologize about this cough. I did not realize what crossing that line would do to me mentally and emotionally, but from that day forward, that was pretty much a train wreck. We did it again the next quarter. 1996 ended, the auditors did not detect the fraud. Bill Owens, very clever. 1997 was beginning, and we begged with Richard to tell Wall Street that we we're going to have a down year. <clears throat> and he would not do it. And he promised Wall Street another year I knew we could not achieve. At the end of the first quarter, we'd missed our numbers badly. And uh, <clears throat> by now, about six people were involved in the fraud. We met with Richard and decided to cook the books again. 
And at the end of the meeting, he did something very interesting. He said, guys, if we're ever caught, I'm going to deny everything. He said, I don't know what your game plan is, but I will deny everything. <coughs> By now, I was probably on the way to becoming alcoholic. I felt trapped. For the first time in my life, I did not enjoy going to work. And I decided to just leave the company. I just wanted out. I wanted to retire. I told Richard, and he said he thought I was making a mistake, but in 1997, I left the company. <coughs> as soon as I could, I sold all of my health house stock. I moved to Fairhope, Alabama. <coughs> I bought a very nice piece of property. I built a big house and a swimming pool and a guest house and a barn and I even built a football field in my backyard. I'm not sure why I did that, but I did. <laughs> <coughs> About a year after I'd been retired, Richard gave me a phone call and he said, come to Birmingham, I'm going to talk to you. So I drove up to Birmingham to his uh, had private dining room with his private chef and he said, Aaron, come back to work. He said, we're making our numbers fine now. You don't need to worry about that. He said, I want you back on the team. And I told him no. <clears throat> and I drove the 200 miles or so back to my house. And uh, the years passed. 98, 99, 2000, 2001, 2002. But in the spring of 2003, I heard massive accounting fraud at HealthSouth. I might have just sort of passed out at the time. When I first retired, every time my doorbell rang or the phone rang, I thought it was FBI. But so much time had passed. Richard told me the fraud had stopped. <clears throat> and with all my heart, I wanted to believe it had. And I'd gotten to the point where I wasn't looking over my shoulder or jumping out of my skin every time the doorbell rang. But the next day in the newspaper, Alice Martin, the attorney with the federal government in Northern District of Alabama, said that several people had come forward and admitted their involvement in the fraud. She said, but we know of other people who were involved, and if you're one of those people, <coughs> you need to come forward. And I thought her next sentence was going to be, Aaron Bean, give us a call. <laughs> so I started calling around to hire a criminal attorney. And I got in touch with a fellow in Mobile named Donald Bressman. Called him on the phone, told him my story. He said, okay, Mr. Bean, let me call the feds. I promise I'll call you back before the end of the day. About two hours later, he called back and he said, oh, yeah, Mr. Bean, they want to talk to you. You need to be in my office at 8 o'clock in the morning. <clears throat> so that next morning, my wife and I drove to downtown Mobile met with him, and the first thing he said was, do not lie to me, do not lie to the federal government. Your former employees have told them you were involved. The FBI has seized the Health South building. If you try to lie your way out of this, you're going to prison for a long time. By now, my wife was in tears, and <clears throat> I was pretty upset, and I asked him if he needed a, a check for a retainer. He said, yes, and he said, make the check for $100,000. And I said, you're kidding. And he kind of snapped at me. He said, I'm not kidding. And he said, it won't be the last check you're going to have to write me. <coughs> so I, as I was making out the check, I asked him if I could get a T-shirt or something. <laughs> and he actually did give me a coffee mug. <laughs> Three days later, I was in a federal building in Birmingham, Alabama, and I'm sitting across the table from two FBI agents, three agents from the SEC, and that's not the Southeastern Conference, <laughs> several attorneys from the federal government, and uh, I am a scared puppy. It lasted all day. I didn't feel like I did very well because I couldn't remember a lot of details. This is 03. And they wanted me to remember in detail as much as I could what happened in 96. <coughs> But at the end of the day, the FBI agent said, Mr. Bean, we know a lot about this case. And from what we can tell today, you've been very truthful. And he said, that's good. He said, so far, 17 people have come forward and admitted their involvement in the fraud. 
He said only one key person denies knowing anything about it. <laughs> Richard Scrushy. And he said, we will have to take Mr. Scrushy to trial, and we will want you to be a witness. Now, I didn't have to go to trial. I'd pled guilty. So I was just waiting to be sentenced. But they wouldn't sentence me until the Scrushy trial was over. And it didn't begin for two years. So my wife and I had two very dark years. I knew I could go to prison 5, 10, 15, maybe more years. Health South stock had gone down to 8 cents. <coughs> Stockholders lost billions, not millions, billions of dollars. And my attorney said, the government's going to take restitution against you. They're going to look at your personal balance sheet, and they're going to take nearly all of it. He said, they won't put you in a box underneath the freeway, <coughs> but you will not have a 25-acre estate with a football field, and you won't be driving that $70,000 BMW that you drive today. You need to be prepared to deal with that. Now, during this two-year period, Richard did some interesting things. First thing he did is he left the church that he'd been attending, <coughs> and he joined an inner city church, and he gave that church a million dollars. He then purchased a small television station in Birmingham and he began preaching the gospel every morning at 8 o'clock. And he would have other ministers come in and preach the gospel with him. He spent $20 million on his legal team. He had seven different lawyers. He hired a jury selection firm to help handpick the jury. There's actually a TV show now called Bull and uh, about that exact thing. He had a publicist. And all during the trial, he never entered the courtroom that he didn't have a Bible in his hand. And he would sit there with his friends and family and <coughs> ministers, and they would all have Bibles. And about once a week, at the end of the day, they'd have church services on the courtyard steps. I thought it was silly. He's trying to taint the jury pool, and they're surely going to see through this. <coughs> Now, this was the first Zora Baines Oxley case tried in the United States. So it was a big deal, not just in Birmingham, but in Washington. And the government wanted me to be the first witness. They felt like I was very professor-like. I guess it's a beard. And it would be my job to explain to the jurors uh, all the financial terms they had to understand, because this is a financial crime. What are street expectations? What are earnings per share? What's a balance sheet? What's an income statement? <coughs> so they got me on the stand. I'm making eye contact with the jury, and I'm explaining all these things, and they're falling asleep. They are bored out of their minds. Within minutes, they are falling asleep. That night on television, Richard's lawyer, one of them from Dothan, Alabama, said, we're not going to take that approach. We're going to make it fun for these people. We're not going to bore them with stuff they can't understand. He said, it's going to be fun. He says, you need to watch the trial. It's going to be fun. So he got me on the stand the next day. He got in my face. Mr. Bean, you've had an extramarital affair, haven't you? I said, yes. I was under oath, and I was not going to lie. The next day, my wife wanted to come to the courtroom holding a sign saying she loved me and in June, we celebrated our 47th wedding anniversary. And I've since learned that this turkey's been married four times. But I digress. He then got in my face. He says, Mr. Bean, when you went to New York City and met with investors, you lied. Mr. Bean, when you presented the numbers to stockholders and board of directors, you lied. You're a cheat. You're a liar. You lie so much, you don't know when you're telling the truth. I looked at the jurors and their eyes were that big. They were paying attention. They were being entertained. The trial lasted six months. The jury deliberated six weeks. Not guilty. All charges. The legal community could hardly believe it. The federal government seldom loses a case like this. Enron, WorldCom, Tyco, Martha Stewart, they all went to prison, but not Richard Scrooge. Within a few days, he held a news conference to announce that he'd be flying to Houston, Texas, <coughs> to advise Ken Lay on how to conduct the Enron trial. 
The Birmingham newspaper interviewed some of the jurors and asked them how was 17 people under oath all testifying that Mr. Scrushy was at the middle of the fraud. How did you find him not guilty? And some of them said, all those CFOs seem like liars, and Mr. Scrushy seemed like a nice Christian man. I cried when I read that. <clears throat> Within a few weeks, I was sentenced to prison and I got only three months, and I'm not sure why I got such a light sentence, but I'm human, so I didn't volunteer to go longer than I had to. <laughs> they sent me to a uh, federal minimum security prison inside of an Air Force base in Montgomery, Alabama. Now, I don't know how many of you are doing something that might put you in prison, <coughs> but if you ever have to go to prison, you better hope you qualify for a federal minimum security prison. <laughs> Some people call it country club prison. Trust me, it's not a country club. <clears throat> but they do a pretty good job of screening people. If you have violence in your background, you don't go to this kind of prison. They told me when to be there, what time. My wife drove me to prison. That might be the lowest day in your life when your wife drives you to prison. And uh, while it's federal minimum security prison, I'm still nervous. The first night when I took a shower, I kept looking behind me. And Nothing happened. The worst thing about the place was the food. <coughs> the budget to feed us was $3 a day, not a meal. And somewhere on this Air Force base, there was a government warehouse full of canned peaches. And every morning for breakfast, almost without exception, we were fed canned peaches and grits. That was it. No eggs, no bacon. Every other meal, the dessert was always canned peaches. After about a week, I had a right to call my wife for the first time, and I kind of went on and on <coughs> about how bad the food was. And finally, she said, Aaron, you're in prison. So I quit <laughs> complaining to her. <coughs> There's a lot of interesting people in a prison like this. A lot of what you think of as white-collar criminals, accountants, judges, lawyers, Three beds down from me was a thoracic surgeon who had cheated the Medicare program, and I think he was doing about five years. I became friends with a fellow whose son actually married Chelsea Clinton. He was a politician that embezzled campaign funds or something. But surprisingly, if you're a drug dealer and you don't have violence in your background, <coughs> and you don't use a weapon when you're selling your drugs, and you're busted by the feds, you can go to this kind of prison. So it was almost 50-50, white-collar criminal and nonviolent drug dealers. I was there during football season. <coughs> In one week, I learned that the LSU game was going to be televised. There's one TV set in your barracks, and you can watch it until 10 o'clock at night. So all week long, I was on cloud nine, because for three hours, <clears throat> that Saturday night, it would be like I'm not in prison. I'd be doing what I love to do, and that's watch LSU football. So I went in to watch the game, and the lobby was full of drug dealers from Miami. And they were watching the Miami Hurricanes play. <clears throat> and one of them said, oh, no, Pops. I'd never been called Pops before in my life. That hurt in itself. <laughs> oh, no, Pops. You're not going to watch your Tigers play. We're going to watch our Hurricanes play. I was depressed. I went around to every other barracks, which you're not supposed to do. Every time I found a TV set, the drug dealers from Miami were watching the Hurricanes play. <laughs> Football season ends. LSU gets an invitation to the Peach Bowl, and our opponent is the Miami Hurricanes. <laughs> <coughs> I called my wife, and I said, I'm going to get to see this game, I, I, for sure. So the night before the game, Right before 10 o'clock, when you're supposed to be in your bed and they turn out the light, three of these drug dealers came to my bedside and asked for my shoelaces. And I said, why? And they said, so you won't hang yourself tomorrow when Miami kicks LSU's ass. <laughs> <coughs> so here it is. It's game time. It's me and about 35 drug dealers from Miami. <laughs> and LSU won 40 to 3. And it was the most fun I had while I was in prison. I've got you laughing, but now it's time to get serious. I got out of prison. I am now a felon. I am a felon today. I will be known as a felon the rest of my life. 
that title never leaves you. My legacy is not that I started one of the most successful healthcare companies in the history of the United States. I'm the guy that cooked the books. It started on my watch. I needed a job, as my attorney explained to me. The government took nearly all of my money. I did need a job, and I could not get one. The job market for felons is not good. So I did what I did when I was 15 years old. <coughs> I earned my first dollar mowing lawns, and here I am in my 60s, and I'm mowing lawns for a living. It's really hard. Uh, you live in this part of the country. Mowing your grass in March and April is not too bad. But mowing your lawn in June, July, August, September, not fun. Not fun at all. <clears throat> I did it for almost three years. My wife kept encouraging me, though, to go to LSU and tell my story, talk to the business student. She thought it would be cathartic for me to do that. I finally got up the courage and called the dean of the business school, and he said, come talk to our MBAs. So I did, and... Uh, I didn't realize what I was getting myself into. I was very emotional. I, I broke down and cried about three times. At one point, I just didn't think I could even finish. But <clears throat> telling the story the first time was, was very difficult. But I got through it, and I didn't think about doing it anymore. Enron, WorldCom, Tyco, HealthSouth, all these big frauds that kind of faded from the scene. But about this time, something happened, something called the subprime debacle. We learned that millions of cheater loans were made. People were taught how to lie on loan applications so they could buy homes that they couldn't afford. Didn't seem to be a problem. We were in a real estate bubble. The smart guys on Wall Street packaged these loans, called them mortgage-backed securities, touted them highly while their hedge funds were shorting the same securities. <coughs> Nobody foresaw what Millions of people cheating a little could do to our economy. But the real estate bubble burst one day, and almost overnight, you lived through it, all of a sudden, millions of people upside down on their mortgages. Condos in Pensacola and Gulf Shores and Orange Beach that sold for eight, nine hundred thousand dollars couldn't be given away for half that price. Our large insurance companies are in trouble. Our large investment banking firms are in trouble. In fact, every one of our firms, including Goldman Sachs, is in Washington begging for a government bailout, and we're in the Great Recession, the worst since the Great Depression. <clears throat> and I got to asking myself, how could this happen? It happened just like hell south. As long as you were making a lot of money and cheating, but nobody knew you were cheating, it didn't seem to be a problem. But nobody foresaw what this massive real estate stock market scandal would do to our economy. <clears throat> so I started contacting universities, and I discovered that they were scrambling to teach ethics. And I started contacting universities, and today I've spoken to 80 different universities, CPA societies, uh, fraud societies, all kinds of people about uh, ethics. Now, here's the problem. This is a cover of Time Magazine in 2010. Why Main Street hates Wall Street? In society, in business, in government, as long as there's a high level of trust, things work pretty well. <coughs> Fortune Magazine had voted Enron as the best company in the nation two years in a row. The best company in the U.S., Enron. And it just crumbled to the ground because of its fraud. The largest accounting firm in the United States had to go out of business because of them. And the general public started asking, where were the board of directors? Where were the uh, SEC? Where, where was the, uh, the auditors, the outside auditors? How could this happen? They lost trust in our society. A professor at Duke University has written a book recently, and he said, trust. A society without trust isn't a society. It's a collection of people <coughs> who are continuously afraid of each other. 
That's why you're here today to hear me speak. That's why you teach ethics in college. That's why every company has a corporate compliance officer today. Every company has a hotline. We need to build back the trust that we once had in our business systems. I took it on myself in 2015 to write a book about large corporate frauds. In this book, I designed this model, and the book is not about somebody stealing $15 from petty cash. It's about Enron, WorldCom, HealthSouth. How do these large frauds happen? <coughs> At the center of these frauds, you do have a leader. You have a Richard Scrooge, a Bernie Evers, a Jeff Skilling, and these guys tend to have similar personalities. They're very charismatic. They have big personalities. They can get people to follow them <coughs> through their intimidation or their charm. But they also have one thing in common for sure. They measure success by how much money they can accumulate. That's it. They don't care about ethics or anything. It's about making money and making themselves rich. <coughs> now, they don't actually cook the books. They have the enablers. This is typically the CFO. He's the one that actually cooks the books. Why does the accountant do it? It kind of goes back, keep in mind human beings are the one that cooks the books. Books don't cook themselves. And you look at the accountant, accountants typically is a, a guy with a green visor over the ledger. They don't measure in accounting to go into sales or even into management necessarily. They're happy keeping a set of books, <coughs> being a backroom person. But they learn over time that if they can help their company by helping the numbers a little, they can get bigger pay raises in advance. And over time, they may cross the line and commit fraud. Now, there are fiduciaries that are supposed to not let these things happen. <coughs> these people are supposed to look out for the public, not the company. I'm talking about boards of directors, outside auditors, the SEC, Moody's and Standard & Poor's, investment banking firms, law firms, CPA firms. They're supposed to look out for the public, not the company. What's the big elephant in the room that nobody wants to admit is there? <coughs> Who compensates these people? The company. Boards of directors over the years have been good old boy clubs. They played golf with this guy. Uh, so over time, the person that hands you your paycheck can influence, it's a basic conflict of interest is what it is. <coughs> and as we all know, studying uh, ethics, conflicts of interest are where things begin sometimes. Rank and file employees become involved. And I'm telling you all this because you may not be the guy in the center ever. You're probably sitting here thinking, well, this is fun to hear about, but I'm never going to be involved in a huge corporate fraud. You might be at the employee level. You may be working at a company riddled with fraud. Why don't the employees blow the whistle and stop it? <coughs> when I left HealthSouth, there were only eight people that knew about the fraud. But I'm told by 2003, hundreds of people knew about it. Employees do it because simply they don't want to lose their job. And they're probably proud that they work for Enron or HealthSouth. These are great companies. And they rationalize that the funny accounting they're doing has got to be okay. I mean, it's Enron, it's HealthSouth. Suppliers and vendors never blow the whistle because they're feeding at the trough. And then I have a big circle called society. We put Richard Scrooge's on pedestals because they're titans of fortune. They've made people lots of money. There were numerous buildings and highways and schools in Birmingham named after Richard Scrooge. <coughs> and these guys begin to believe their own personality. And society fosters their bad behavior. It's almost like the star athlete that can punch out his girlfriend and keep playing football because he's so good. I also am doing a research paper <coughs> with a professor. I think the Kardashians are part of the problem. Why we put these women on pedestals and pay them millions of dollars for no other reason than having a big rear end, I don't understand. <laughs> 
talking about society and how things change. In 1806, Webster's published his dictionary and he defined success as being generous, prosperous, healthy, and kind. Today, that definition is the attainment of wealth, fame, and rank. We need to go back to the 1806 definition of success. Having more money than your neighbor, trust me, is truly not a measure of success. It involves a lot of other things. Fraudsters don't wake up one day and say, I'm going to commit a huge corporate fraud today. I think it'll be fun. I think sometimes the general public thinks it's like that, but it's not. All frauds, or most frauds anyway, start because of some kind of pressure. With the public company, it's those quarterly earnings. Wall Street wants better numbers every quarter, 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 quarter after quarter. On a personal level, you may start committing fraud because you're trying to keep up with the Joneses. You have a drug problem, drinking problem, gambling problem. You have sickness in your family. Something pressures you to cross that line. It starts small, it grows over time, and then there's no way out. How do you build ethical strength? How do you not get into the trap like I did? Why did I go wrong? One of the reasons is that I didn't have the courage to do the right thing. It takes a lot of courage to be ethical, to always do the right thing. In 400 A.D., St. Augustine said that complete abstinence is easier than perfect moderation. What was he saying? He says it's easier to be right all the time, complete abstinence from wrongdoing, rather than having just moderate misbehavior every now and then. Let me give you an example. What is the right moderate amount of texting while you're driving? Zero. 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 You can kill somebody. What is the right moderate amount of cheating on your taxes? Zero. Cheating in college? Zero. Cooking your company's books? Padding an insurance claim? Zero. Now, we're human. We can't be perfect all the time. But when you set your ethical standard below perfect, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> And you rationalize that some moderate amount of cheating is okay. A little bit of cheating is okay. You are already on the slippery slope. You need to pattern your life after being perfect when it comes to ethical things. Don't accept any cheating. It sounds kind of radical, but then it sounds pretty basic, too. That's how you build ethical strength. You have to work at it. You have to know what to do. As a student, you should study Enron, WorldCom, Tyco, HealthSouth. You need to know what to do when you're faced with the same kind of situations. Think of it like this. You're a professional baseball player. There's two men on base, two outs. You're the shortstop. They hit you the ball. Do you pick it up and go, I wonder what I ought to do? No. You're trained. You know what to do with that ball. And you do it right then. You need to behave that way when it comes to ethics. Don't rationalize bad behavior. Don't stop and think about, well, is this okay to uh, fudge these numbers a little bit? No, no. Let me end with a story, and then we'll do a little Q&A. In 2010, an airplane took off from LaGuardia Airport. There were 155 people on board. Shortly after taking off, birds flew into the engines of that airplane and they lost all power. And he knew he had to land that airplane somehow. And he thought about going back to LaGuardia, didn't have enough time. Thought about going to Teterboro Airport, didn't have time. So he landed that airplane in the middle of New York City on a river and nobody even got hurt. I think that's more spectacular than going to the moon or winning the Super Bowl. And when they asked him how he could do it, he said, because every day of my adult life, I prepared for this moment. I studied every airplane crash, every water landing, every emergency procedure, and I knew what to do when those birds flew into my engine. 
I tell students, particularly accounting students, birds will fly into your engine one day and you need to know what to do or you may go to prison like I did.